YouTubers and NFL fans everywhere. This is Matt, the NFL fanatic, giving you my 2016-2017 NFL wildcard round weekend predictions. Well, we are officially at the end of another regular season. It's uh, bittersweet. It's been an exciting 256 games, as always. Uh, there's been several teams that uh, disappointed several teams that uplifted that I didn't expect to be in the positions they are but uh, I'm going to say to all those teams the good ones uh, you know they're in the playoffs bad ones uh, that didn't make the playoffs and everybody in between uh, it was a just another fantastic NFL season especially with doing picks um, last week to end the regular season against the spread I had my second consecutive 11-5 and five week against the spread and straight up I did even better by going 12 and 4 and for the first year for doing against the spread I achieved my goal of hitting the over 500 mark I finished the year at 124 116 and 8 which equals about 52% 51.7% so rounded up to 52% and straight up for the year so far for the regular season I have I finished the regular season at 160 94 and two. So there's 74 games above. Sorry. Uh, 70. There's 66 games above 500. Uh, I'm very happy with that. That equals 63%. So for both my goals uh, this year, is I always try to get about that 63% straight up. And my first year against this run, I went over 500. I achieved both those goals. And I am very happy with my results. Uh, so for this year. And I would like to thank everybody uh, for that tuned in to watch all my videos, to hear my thoughts on each game, and I, I truly appreciate it from the NFL YouTube prognosticators page, all the great progs, and all the people that, that weren't progs as well, thank you for uh, watching my videos, commenting, liking them, um, because I appreciate the uh, feedback and the uh, thoughts on my predictions, and I was just like having a good conversation between fans uh, that have uh, different viewpoints, because it's always good for... Uh, for all fans to hear different viewpoints of certain situations and it can help mold uh, each other's opinions and thoughts uh, due to what happens on the field and due to uh, what they say. So I want to thank everybody again for watching all my picks through the regular season and I hope that you all will stay with me through this, uh, this postseason. Um, so I will now also add a postseason bracket under my uh, regular season uh, and against the spread picks. Uh, and right now, I would like to tell you guys, or everybody out there watching, my AFC and NFC bracket predictions um, for the uh, road to Super Bowl 51 in Houston, Texas. So for the AFC, I have the number four seed, Houston Texans, over the number five seed, Oakland Raiders. And then for the Second wildcard game, I have the number three seed, the Pittsburgh Steelers, over the Miami Dolphins. That will lead to a divisional round next weekend. The six seed, uh, the number four seed, Houston Texans, going up to the New England Patriots, and the number three seed, Pittsburgh Steelers, going up to the number two seed, Kansas City Chiefs. Uh, <laughs> obviously, with what Houston's going through, I think this is very Alabama, Chattanooga like in the terms of a cupcake game for the New England Patriots, so I, I, I easily think they're going to breeze past the Houston Texans. And then for the Pittsburgh Steelers, Kansas City Chiefs game, this is going to be the pretty much best game over the next two weeks in the AFC if this happens. Um, it's going to be a very close game. I don't think the Chiefs are going to get embarrassed like they did um, early in the year when they lost 42-14 to against an angry Steeler team that just came off a 34-3 to blowout themselves against the Philadelphia Eagles. I think the Chiefs have a very good chance to win this game. Andy Reid's coming off a bye, and he has the best record in NFL history when doing that. But just knowing how Andy Reid and knowing this Kansas City culture over the last several years, Andy Reid's kind of had a Marty Schottenheimer type of run in Kansas City where he may get you one or two, you know, he's gotten you, them one playoff win in the last three years. But just knowing how he is, I'm going to begrudgingly take the Steelers here by a slight margin, I think you know the Chiefs have an uh, you know a chance to win. And personally, as a Ravens fan, I'll be rooting for the Chiefs. But my head is telling me 
take the Pittsburgh Steelers here just because they've had these big moments and um, the last time they were in Kansas City, they did lose. And that was the, the start of their uh, impressive winning streak that's going on this year, which still has them as the best record in the NFL since week seven of last year. I'm going to take Pittsburgh here. You have the three Bs all together and just knowing what that offense can do and knowing what Antonio Brown has done to Marcus Peters over the last couple times, I think that they can, the Steelers have enough experience, enough culture to pull this one out and get a nail-biting win against Kansas City. So that will lead us to the New England Patriots hosting the Pittsburgh Steelers in the AFC Championship game. I have the New England Patriots, uh, who are making their sixth consecutive AFC Championship game. I believe that is an NFL record, so congratulations for them. And This will be Brady and Belichick's, I believe, 11th, which is utterly amazing in a 15-year span. But I have the New England Patriots beating the Pittsburgh Steelers in Foxborough. Uh, honestly, there was only one team in the whole NFL that if they had to go into Foxborough, the Patriots would feel that, you know, they would be a dogfight. And, of course, it's uh, my team, the Baltimore Ravens, who uh, pretty much crapped the bed at the uh, last game of the year, losing by 17 to a uh, second-string Bengal team. But I digress. Um, but now with that, you know, I Steelers fans are going to say, well, they don't have Rob Gronkowski. You know, they, have, they haven't played a lot of competition. We have Le'Veon Bell, Antonio Brown, and Big Ben. That is a, you know, tremendous offense. But the, the Patriots can, I don't think they're going to give up, you know, 150, 160 plus yards to Le'Veon. And obviously, at every other wide receiver position, the New England Patriots have a better weapon. And they have a much better tight end than Martellus Bennett than a overpaid Ladarius Green, who has contributed very little for the $4 million he's been paid. And also this fun little stat here, uh, the, the Pittsburgh Steelers have never beaten with Ben Roethlisberger, a Tom Brady-led New England Patriot team in Foxborough. The only time that Big Ben Roethlisberger has won in uh, New England, you have to go back to 2008, and of course that was the year when Brady tore his ACL week one, so he beat Matt Cass. Um, So that's how I have it. So again, I, I know it's maybe not the surprise, it's not the hot take, it's I'm going to go with the old conventional here. I'm going with the New England Patriots out of the AFC uh, to represent the AFC in the Super Bowl. For the NFC side, I have, uh, for the two NFC wildcard games, I have the three-seeded Seattle Seahawks beating the six-seeded Detroit Lions. And then I have the number four-seed Green Bay Packers beating the number five-seed New York Giants. And I'll go, I'll, get, I'll go with the spreads here and deeper explanations here in a second. And then after that, that would then uh, move the Seattle Seahawks going up to Atlanta and as great as Seattle, you know, or as shaky as they've been and as much talent and experience they've had in these situations, and this is the first time the, the Falcons have been in the playoffs in three years, um, I'm going to take Atlanta here just because I have no trust in that Seattle team on the road. They are about average on the road since Wilson and Carroll have been together, and just this year on the road, their offense has been able to do anything, and it took them... It took them a late drive uh, to beat the, the San Francisco 49ers, who, whose only two wins were against the L.A. Rams, who just got blown up 44-6 to uh, against the Arizona Cardinals. So I'm a big Russell Wilson fan. I am rooting for him personally to, to attempt to get his second Super ring, but I do not think he will get it. He could get a playoff win against the Lions this weekend, but once he goes up to Atlanta, I'm going to take the Falcons here just because I, I don't have any trust in that Seattle unit as a whole on the road. In that dome. And then when you have the Cowboys uh, hosting the Packers, that's going to be a close game. I think Aaron Rodgers and that Packer team, knowing what happened earlier in the year uh, with week uh, five um, when they were in Lambeau, I think Aaron and them, they were kind of going through the motions. Eddie Lacy went down of an injury, and they really didn't have a running game. They have somehow been able to last over the last six weeks to have been able to achieve a running game. Uh, with the combination of Ty Montgomery, uh, Krista Michael, and uh, Ripkowski, uh, their fullback who's done really well. And I, I think Aaron Rodgers, who's been playing the best football over the last six weeks, very Russell Wilson last year-like, he will put up a much better fight against the Cowboy team that is well, uh, that'll be well-rested. But, you know, we'll have to see how these all these young guys in this spot uh, will handle the pressure. So, But I, I think at the end of the day, 
with it being at home, with the rest being there. I think the uh, Packers defense really has no secondary or real, you know, real legitimate secondary to speak of. Uh, Quinn Rollins and another one of their corners went down last night, so uh, that's going to be a very difficult task if they can't make it over the next couple weeks. And just looking at how the Cowboys have been able to run the ball, uh, I think they'll be able to do exactly what they did against the Packers in Lambeau with Zeke that they did in, Lam uh, in Green Bay back in Week 5. Uh, so I would have the Cowboys beating the Packers and the Falcons beating the Seahawks leading to a NFC Championship game of the Atlanta Falcons going to the Dallas Cowboys. Um, and in that game, I'm going to take the Dallas Cowboys to win just because I know the Falcons will score on the Cowboys defense. But if you look at the Cowboys defense in terms of overall, the Cowboys defense is underrated. And I really feel that, you know, the Cowboys... Um, can hold enough and limit the Falcons enough to get, you know to let the Cowboys offense go against the 25th ranked overall defense in Atlanta to get the victory. Um, it will be a shootout and it may be one of the highest scoring NFL postseason games in NFL history by the time it ends. But I'm going to go with the better defense here in this uh, slight margin. I'm going to go with Dak um, and the Cowboys to win. So I'm going to have two number one seeds for the four year four year in a row. Making it to the Super Bowl, you're going to have New England playing the Dallas Cowboys. And in that game, I'm going to go with the New England Patriots to win Super Bowl 51 because I honestly just feel that when in, the, in that kind of game, you go with the experience. You know, I know a lot of people are probably going to say, man, we don't want to, you know, we don't want anybody to win. Who wants the Patriots to win and who wants the Cowboys to win? A lot of fans that are, aren't either Patriot fans or Cowboy fans or not AFC East or NFC East fans that are just going to say, well, you know, it's not New England. We don't want Dallas. A lot of people don't want any of them to win because they're the two most hated teams in the NFL. But at the end of the day, I'm going to go with the experience here. Brady's been on a mission. He's looked a lot more spectacular. And as great as Dak and Zeke have been, I think the Cowboys will give the Patriots a fight because their two weaknesses are the Cowboys have the best offensive line in football, uh, and Dak will be able to have time to make throws, and Dak doesn't turn the ball over that often, and the Patriots have committed very or have caused very few turnovers this year. And with that combination in mind, they have a shot, but at the end of the day, if you give me Brady and Belichick against that Dallas defense versus uh, Dak and Zeke against the Patriot defense, which is uh, number one overall, I believe, right now, I'm going to go with the Patriots here. And to give Tom Brady and Belichick their fifth ring together. And uh, the redemption for all Patriot fans will be complete. Shout out to Andrew Warren. Congratulations for my prediction. Uh, and again, as the postseason goes on, I will adjust my bracket. And I will t take blame uh, you know, for putting out my bracket early. But I know there was somebody that commented that for my Super Bowl 51 prediction. So... Um, for that person that was in the comments, there you go. If you watched the video this week, there is my Super Bowl 51 bracket prediction all the way through. So, so time for my uh, against the spread picks and thoughts on each of the, of the first four wildcard games. So, in the first one, with the uh, number five seeded Oakland Raiders going to the number four seeded Houston Texans, the Houston Texans are three and a half point favorites in this game. I like Houston minus three and a half. Um, in that in that perspective. In the next game, uh, when the number six seeded Detroit Lions go to the number three seeded Seattle Seahawks, the Seahawks are favored by eight points in this game. I think that is way too many for a Seattle team that uh, at home has played in a few close games against quality teams. And Detroit, even though they've been on a downswing over the last few weeks, Detroit's a good enough team that I, I'm not going to say that they're going to blow them out or win by over... Uh, 10 points or more, or 9 points or more. So I'm going to take Detroit here. I'm going to take the points here with Detroit plus 8, and I'm going to stick with the Seattle Seahawks to win straight up. And then the next game with the number 6 seed of Miami Dolphins go to the number 3 seed of Pittsburgh Steelers. The Miami Dolphins are 10-point underdogs in this game. I think with how Miami is playing and just of how Pittsburgh is as a team, uh, I think the Steelers, take it, it's going to be that rust versus rest factor. I, I totally was fine with them resting their guys because they didn't need to play in a meaningless game against the Browns, which they won, by the way. Um, but, you know, and also congrats to the Cleveland real quick. They got the number one overall pick. 
bravo. Good luck with that. <laughs> um, they've had a lot of number one picks in the uh, they've had a few number one picks in the past. Haven't really panned out that well in the first round. So good luck to the individual that goes there. Um, but with the ten point spread, I think that is way too many. I think Miami they played more consistent over the last eleven games. That and, they, and remember they beat this team by fifteen points earlier in the year in Miami. So I don't think they're going to win the game because now it's in Pittsburgh and they haven't won in Pittsburgh in about I think it was what twice in about twenty about twenty six years. Yeah, two times in twenty six years uh, they've won in Pittsburgh. But I think that they can make this a game if Tannehill can come back or Matt Moore can play like he has a majority of this year. I think Matt Moore can put up a decent enough fight to lead to get the Dolphins in a position to keep the game close for a while, and either Ben, ben Le'Veon or Brown score a game-winning touchdown, or, you know, they, they kick a game-winning field goal. Especially if Ajayi can do what he did last time against the Steelers and run for over 200 yards. I don't think that will happen, but if they do, if that, you know, if they can get a consistent running game going, Moore can play solid football, they have a shot to make the game close enough to not count on the 10-point spread. And finally, when the... Number five seed of New York Giants go to the Green Bay Packers. The Packers are four point favorites in this game. I like Green Bay minus four. And the Packers straight up as well. Alright, it's so time for my thoughts in each game. Raiders at Texans. Man, this is going to be the bore of the weekend. It's just because of the quarterbacks. You know, when you look at the Houston Texans, they lost to the Tennessee Titans. And all their starters were out there. I was I was a little surprised by that. The one guy, you know, a couple guys were injured. They didn't play. Like, I don't think Clowney played or Lamar Miller played because they were hurt. But everybody else there was starting. And I would have been more okay if they would have said, DeAndre, you could sit. Um, some of their better off. Vince Wolford, you could sit. Uh, Cushing could have sat. Uh, Joseph could have sat. Um, Kareem Jackson could have sat. You know, I would have been okay with that. But they had their starters out there, and they lost to the Matt Castle <laughs> in a meaningless game for them, and they both finished at 9-7. Shout out to my friend Keith Bailey, who's angry at uh, the former Houston Texan kicker Randy Bullock for missing a 43-yard field goal. That would have given the Titan, Tennessee Titans the AFC South with a win. Uh, but shout out to him. Uh, and sorry, Keith. <laughs> um, but they did not. And this is kind of the, the uh, ineptitude of the Houston Texan offense. They have scored only 25 offensive touchdowns this year. That is the worst for a playoff team in the 16-game regular season era. Think about that. In 16 games, you only scored 25 touchdowns. So that's so basically, that defense, which is number eleven in uh, in points and number one in yards, has basically had to carry that team to another nine and seven season. And again, Tom Savage, uh, you know, played okay, but then he suffered a concussion in the uh, second quarter and was out for the game. So really, his status is up in the air. But he really didn't do anything, and they just kept well. I guess they kept Brock in there because he had a concussion. But honestly, I don't know who's going to be starting a quarterback for Brock or Tom. It's going to be about the same kind of production. But and then, but the problem is that the Texans is is erratic, as docile, as putrid, or any bad word you can think of that you know connected with their offense. They're playing a Raider team that right now, you know, lost their anchor with their quarterback Derek Carr fracturing his fibula. And just watching Matt McGloin, who went out himself with a shoulder injury, it didn't it, it didn't help. And I know there was a lot of people saying, well, maybe Matt McGloin could do something. You know, he has a lot of offensive talent around him. That really didn't pan out, and they only scored six points. And that wasn't because of him, that was because he got hurt and Connor Cook came in. And there's just an aspect of where, when you look at this team, the Oakland defense is ranked 20th in points and 26th in yards. So... Derek Carr, who should be in the MVP conversation. Now, with his injury with the last couple games, I don't think he'll get in. But if he would have won his 13th game, if he would have been healthy enough, I think that he could have easily got back into the top five with a win uh, in securing the number two seed. But with that defense being so bad, and an offense that, uh, for the first time since week 13 of the 2014 season, they scored under seven points. And, of course, that in that week, that was the infamous 52 nothing shutout game by the St. Louis Rams. So, when I look at this game, it's, I know, like, Oakland has the better talent. They have the better flashes of Cooper, Crabtree, Murray. They have the better offensive line. They have, um, the tight ends about, or a push. They have the more experienced head coach. 
and they've just been a better team this whole year. But knowing that Matt McGloin has a shoulder injury and likely that he's not going to play, the Raiders even themselves said he's not. they're not optimistic he can play, I have to take the Texans here. Because if you're going to tell me Connor Cook in his first start is going to be a playoff game, and, and somebody please uh, shout out to Halfman's Picks. Thank you for uh, helping out with the one stat with the Bucks sweeping the Panthers last week. Check out his videos, Halfman's Picks. He is a great prog. And also, congrats to your Lions, buddy. Uh, first time since 97 through 99, the Lions made the playoffs two times in three seasons. So, shout out to him. But I really want to find out. Connor Cook may be the first quarterback in NFL history to be a rookie quarterback in his first game is an NFL playoff game. There have been rookie quarterbacks that have started in NFL playoff games, but they were in the regular season, too, or they had, reg they had a regular season game to play. I think he might be the first NFL quarterback that I've known of that he's been a rookie quarterback in his first game. He didn't play any regular season games. His first game starting is an NFL playoff game. And with that notion, just knowing that against that Houston defense, and Houston has a lot of motivation too because last time they were in this spot on ESPN, the first wild card game, they got shut up by an AFC West rival, 30 to nothing, and that was Kansas City. I guarantee you the Texans are looking at Oakland in Kansas City red, white, and yellow because they want revenge and they want to look better. <laughs> from that moment. It's going to be a low-scoring game. I think it, whoever scores a touchdown first will win the game because I think the, all the other scoring will be will be from field goals. But at, at the end of the day, I think Houston has the better defense and they're going to have the more experienced quarterback. And whether it's Savage or Osweiler, I think they, they will do enough with what they know how to you know run an offense. Even though Oakland and Cook or McGloin will have better talent, I'm going to take the Texans here. Better defense better running back, and with the quarterback, I'm going to just trust Savage and Osweiler to have enough experience to push them through a game that is going to be good for the Texans franchise. First playoff win since, you know, 2012, but it's going to be just one of those things where the Texans fans will know inside. They, if their car was playing, they would have no chance. <laughs> but, hey, you know, at the end of the day, you get to play who you can play. So, uh, so that's what I'm going to go with Houston minus three and a half, and Houston straight up. Next game, Seahawks over the Lions. Um, you know what? The Lions, they put up a good fight against the Packers. But there's been this consistent uh, aspect of Matthew Stafford in primetime games. And I want to shout out uh, a guy that's been commenting on my video, Hatter's House. Um, I made a, a statement about the Matthew Stafford um, game, his record against teams with a winning record. Okay, uh, I actually looked this up. This was on NFL Stats and Info, uh, or uh, Mind Blowing Stats and Info.com. So for Hatter's House, this is an actual stat that is uh, on the NFL.com website. Uh, Matthew Stafford is now uh, five and forty-four against teams with a winning record at the end of the season. That or against teams that finish with a winning record at the end of the season. I'm going to give him some credit here because that is a little bit misleading. Because there have been times when Matthew Stafford has played teams that at the time had either, you know, were 8-7, 3-0, and you know, the, you know, the Redskins, the Eagles this year, the Vikings twice, where they had winning records going into those games, and he was able to win those games. So that is a little bit misleading, so I will say that he, he does, I think he has more than five wins against winning teams. But with that stat now, you know, from the NFL.com website, it is now dropped to 5-44. and 44. Um, against teams that finished their season with a winning record. Um, but, yeah. So, when you look at how the Lions played, though, I think one little surprise has been the uh, fifth-round running back of uh, named Zach Zenner. He, or, or, I think he was undrafted. An undrafted running back out of South Dakota State, go Jackrabbits, um, whose last two weeks after uh, Theo Riddick and Abdullah went on the IR has done very well for himself. He's had three touchdowns in the last two games, in the previous eight, uh, 18 games he's played, as, as a uh, Lion, he only had one. And I think he's become a nice running back for them. And I think with how he's played, he's earned the right going into next year to probably be the number one running back for this team. Um, and But when you look at how the Lions played, Stafford was able to move the ball, and that was probably the best he had played over the last three weeks with his uh, middle finger or with his knuckle injury. Uh, I just want to congratulate Golden Tate. He got his first touchdown against the Packers since the infamous Fail Mary game in week four, even though that was a pick by Anquan Bolden. But again, he's a veteran, and they got away with it. So <laughs> kudos uh, 
see the lines for that aspect. But it's just an aspect where with the Lions, they backed in because Washington and Kirk Cousins choked out with the uh, interception. But, hey, look, for the Lions, they are going to put up a fight because, look, this is a team that has 8-4-4 comebacks in a single season, most in NFL history. And just looking at how the Lions play, they're not going to go down, you know, like they, did, like they did against Dallas a couple weeks ago in Dallas. You know, it's a much diff- much tougher place to play in Seattle, Washington, compared to Dallas, Texas. And uh, I think it's just something where when you look at the Seahawks, um, Russell Wilson, he, he achieved a very important stat. He ties Matt Ryan for getting the most amount of regular season wins in a quarterback's first five years. Both of them had 56 total wins in their first five years. He should be the all-time record holder, but if it wasn't for Hauschka missing a kick, uh, but I, I digress. But congrats to Russell Wilson for achieving that accomplishment. Uh, but here is one thing that is going to be very tough for the Detroit Lions. This is an actual stat that I looked up. The Seattle Seahawks have not lost a home playoff game since the 2004 season. They haven't lost a home playoff game in 12 years. And they've had a few home playoff games. But in 12 years, they have not lost a home playoff game. The last time they lost was the 05 wildcard round, when I, which I believe was against the St. Louis Rams, and they lost 27-20. to And I believe that was the last time the Rams won a playoff game. So, or even made the playoffs. Yeah, and even made the playoffs. So, um, and when you look at Detroit, they also haven't beat Seattle in Seattle since week one of the 1999 season when they won 27-20 to against Seattle. And there's just an aspect of where I'm going to go with the experience in this one. This is Detroit, a team that, you know, is coming off of a stretch of playing against winning teams and just knowing that they have to go in Seattle in a nighttime game. The Seattle Seahawks at night are very tough to play, and that crowd is going to be more than amped. And the worst part for the Seahawks, or for the Lions fans, is just the antics that go on in those kind of games. On more than, you know, two or three occasions, there have been crazy, wacky stuff that has happened for the, you know, for the Seahawks that have benefited them in victories. And the Lions should know. Last last year, week four, 2015, uh, Matthew Stafford throws the ball to Calvin Johnson. I think he's at the five yard line. He's trying to get in the end zone. And Cam Chancellor, wham, bam, thank you, Cam, levels Johnson, gets the ball loose, and K.J. Wright tipped the ball or, you know, shoved the ball out of the end zone, and that should have been a flag in, in giving Detroit first and goal with about five seconds left, but they didn't call it, and the Seahawks basically saved their season with that win over Detroit. So, you know, for, for Detroit fans, this is going to be a very interesting game just because of that recent history and just the environment in Seattle, but knowing Russell Wilson, knowing what they have done at home, they have shown this year that their offense has played much better at home True, they don't have the talents. You know, I don't like the Lockett's not there. CJ Proceis isn't there. I can't really run the ball. But Detroit really can't run the ball either. And in that instance, I'm going to go with the better coach and the better culture in, in that home environment. And that's why I'm going to go with the with the Seahawks here just because I trust Wilson and Carroll over the team led by Stafford and Caldwell. Sorry, Hatter's house. You know, I'm rooting for your Lions here. Maybe, you know, get their first playoff win. Uh, they had the longest streak uh, in the NFL right now. They haven't had one at a playoff game. Since 91, so it's going on about a quarter of a century now, 25 years. Hope, hope they get it for you, but we will, you know, we will see. We're not going to go with the Hawks here. Uh, but I, I think it will be a one score, under a one score game. So take the, take Detroit with the points, plus eight. Uh, next one Steelers over Dolphins. This one for me, it's, the, you know, the Miami Dolphins, I give them credit. They put all their starters out there. They. <laughs> They tried to knock out New England for the number one seed. That didn't work. <laughs> uh, they got blown out 35-14. to 14. That was their first loss in Miami against New England in the last three years. And just when you look at Miami, I'm just looking at how Pittsburgh's playing as well. Pittsburgh, 11-5. and five. Uh, You know, they they won their 13th straight game against Cleveland at home. And this was, a, this was with their backups. They put their B team out there. Landry Jones now has... Only you know he has two career wins, both against the Cleveland Browns. <laughs> uh, I, I believe at home. So, and the Steelers, they showed how much they little cared about the game because they only gained 52 yards of offense in the first half. That's the lowest amount of yards in the first half they've gained since 2008. 
And just looking at this game, Pittsburgh and Miami, I think Miami, if Tannehill can play, they, they need Tannehill to play because I, I would just trust Tannehill, you know, in that spot. You know, he's, you know, the better pure quarterback than Moore, and he's played pretty consistent, and I think that's the better shot. But everybody knows what Miami has to do to beat the Steeler team. They have to have Ajayi go off again uh, for at least 120 to, you know, or more yards to give the Dolphins a chance. I don't think that will happen. And just knowing how this, you know, Miami team going into Pittsburgh, a warm weather team like Miami traveling up all the way up to the cold north in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, it's not a good formula. Uh, they've only won two times in the last 26 years. Uh, even though, again, the last time that the two played each other in Pittsburgh, they did win that game. So, you know, that might give Miami a little bit of confidence for all those guys that were on that team. But this Pittsburgh team, it's just too talented. I think the rest will benefit. You know, you're going to have Ben, Le'Veon, and Antonio. That's a three-headed monster. I don't I don't see the Dolphins really stopping. Um, then you have Eli Rodgers who can make some plays. Maybe Hayward Bay comes back. Darius Green, you know, he can make some plays. But that's better than what Deion Sims, the Dolphins, have. And just in, in this kind of spot, Adam Gase, there's no pressure on him. But I just think after the kind of game he had against Baltimore in Baltimore, um, I think Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh with what they played, I think Miami has a little bit of a better scheme for that. and I, So I don't think they're going to lose by 32 points. But knowing what he did in that big spot and knowing what the talent he has around him, it's, you know, it's a great thing that he got to the playoffs. But, you know, that's all he needed to do. So, you know, if they get blown out by Pittsburgh, which, you know, could very well possible... Gates and Dolphins, don't be ashamed. You made the playoffs by winning nine of your last 11 games. Nobody thought you'd be a playoff team anyway. So, at the end of the day, Tomlin, Bell, Brown, the other couple of receivers can kind of do more than the Dolphins receivers have. They have the better offensive line. They have some decent uh, defenders. The Dolphins may have the better defense overall with just talent, with just how Pittsburgh has been playing uh, defense. I think that they have a shot. Um to, uh, you know, play better. And they're going to feel better because they know that Ben, Le'Veon, and Brown are back there. (laughs) And they won't have to worry about (laughs) um, the Browns being in the two-yard line and possibly getting a win to knock them out of the number one pick. Um, So that's why I'm going to take Pittsburgh straight up. But again, I think Miami, they played this team before pretty well. I think they have, you know, a team that, you know, if they you know can kind of execute the same way, they can do it again. And I think it will be close. And I think 10 points is way too many for this Dolphins team. That's kind of disrespecting this Dolphins team that's played pretty well. Um, that's why I'm going to take Miami plus 10. But I'm going to take the two straight up. Uh, because, again, caught weather team going up to the uh, cold northeast. Um, and just <laughs> knowing that Ben Brown and Bell, the three killer bees, are back. that are rested. That's way too much to, to put against the Miami Dolphins. So that's all like uh, Miami plus 10, but Pittsburgh straight up. And finally, the Packers over the Giants in Green Bay minus four. Uh, I'll congratulate the uh, Green Bay Packers. Eight straight playoff appearances for the Green Bay Packers and five NFC North Division titles in the last six years. That's an incredible run of consistency, and I believe that they have the longest active streak in the NFL making the playoffs consecutively, tied with the New England Patriots uh, from 2009 to so on to here. Uh, And I want to congratulate Aaron Rodgers. Um... For the, for the second time in three years, he's basically, you know, called his, or, you know, basically relaxed everybody. Remember in 2014 after the loss to the Lions, you know, he's famously said, R-E-L-A-X. Relax. And then the Packers went on to go, I think, 12-4, and 13-3 and three that year. And only lose one game after he said that. And then after they went 4-6 and six and, you know, got lit up by the, by the Washington Redskins, he goes up to the media and says, I think... We can run the table. And by God, did the Packers ever do that? And Aaron Rodgers played like the MVP Aaron Rodgers that we all know and love. Uh, he is the first Green Bay Packer to lead the NFL in touchdowns since Brett Favre did it in 2003. Uh, that year, he was co-MVP, I believe, with Steve McNair. So, you know, so that that helps Aaron Rodgers' MVP chances. And actually, you know, this is the amazing thing about Aaron Rodgers, how great he's been. Uh, this, his touchdown-interception ratio of 40 to 7, I believe, is the second best of his career. He, in 2011, when he won the MVP, uh, deserving the show after 15 one year, he had a touchdown interception ratio of 45 to 6. And in the last seven games, he had thrown 19 touchdowns, no interceptions. He just 
was absolutely on fire. And I know a lot of people are saying after that six-game run, oh, he's the MVP. I would not personally give him the MVP. I think you have to look at the full body of work. And his run was very Russell Wilson-like to me at the end of last year with Russell Wilson. And he, he put up much better numbers than Russell Wilson did. <laughs> uh, but Or he put up similar numbers or just about a little bit better numbers than Russell Wilson did. But that's just a six-game second-half stretch. You know, if you look at his first few years, he wasn't playing bad, but the results weren't coming with that. And again, personally, if just for my MVP quote here, MVP thoughts, uh, I would personally give the Dak Prescott. I think he's played, you know, I know he has all the talent, but he's played the, you know, on the best team of the full year with basically very few mistakes. He had one stinker game against the Giants. But besides that, he's been phenomenal, and I believe he deserves the award. Um... But pers- I, logically, the person I believe that will get it is Matt Ryan because Dak Prescott and Ezekiel Elliott will cancel each other out. Uh, Tom Brady, even though, again, he would be the MVP if he played those four games, but a lot of voters, I believe, will take that four-game suspension and use that against him, especially with the Patriots going 3-1 and one and winning games with not one but two different quarterbacks. Uh, I think Matt Ryan will logically be the choice to be the MVP. He's put up, you know, a... a Franchise high in yards, franchise high in touchdowns, has played consistent the entire year, put up his best statistical season. He's been basically the reason they've won those 11 games, uh, he and Kyle Shanahan together. But, uh, yeah, I think Matt Ryan will be the MVP just because, also, he beat Aaron Rodgers. In the moment when he needed to, you had the head-to-head tiebreaker, and just like the playoffs, I think that's why Matt Ryan should go over Aaron Rodgers because he was one game better than him, and that was it against the uh, Packers. So... Yeah, so, but with that being said, I, I, I look at the uh, this game, and it, this is the best game of the week. Packers and Giants, you have the Green Bay team that is as hot as a meteor right now, winning six straight games and feeling very confident in themselves. Where you have the Giants that now, it's time for the Giants to possibly do what the Giants do best. Just put the Giants in the playoffs, and Eli Manning and his team may magically get better, and they He'd be able to get on a run. <laughs> and when you look at the Giants, this is their best overall record since 2008 when they went 12-4 and were the number one seed in the NFC. That year they lost to the Eagles in the first round, in the divisional round. And what everybody keeps saying is, is that Eli Manning's postseason numbers you know, are, much, are better than his regular season. And it's true. And you know, his postseason numbers, 61.5% completion percentage, higher than the regular season, 2,516 yards. Um, and his touchdown interception ratio is 17 TDs to, nine, uh, to 8 interceptions, higher than his regular season numbers. So, this is going to be an interesting game because, again, Eli Manning, the other three times he's made the playoffs, one and done. The, the other two times he made the playoffs, Super Bowl. And for Aaron Rodgers, this is important for him too because if he loses this game, I would like people to just really wonder about this. Could we consider Aaron Rodgers... The, the new Peyton Manning of the NFL in terms of the postseason. Because if the Giants, you know, can get their win, Giant fans are going to feel that they can win the Super Bowl, and Eli Manning is already 2-0 in Lambeau in the postseason. But now, in an eight-year stretch, when Aaron Rodgers has made the playoffs, that's, if he loses this, um, uh, this weekend, that means that Aaron Rodgers' one-and-done chances in the postseason is a coin flip. That's four times in eight years that he has gone one and done, and you could argue if you talk to Cowboy fans, it should be five because Des Bryant caught the ball. Again, he, I guess I didn't think I didn't think he did, but if he did, you know, they st- the Cowboys might have won the game, but the Packers still had four minutes to go, and I think Rodgers would have got him to a field goal, and then who knows after that. But I digress. But that is really something that people are, are really going to have to consider. Maybe is Aaron Rodgers going to have a Peyton Manning type of postseason stain that is going to be very Hard to, you know, get rid of. And look at his regular season numbers and all his regular season success and not look at it as bright as we do if his postseason's, you know, if 50% of the time, you can maybe expect a one-and-done from Aaron Rodgers. So, again, I, I don't see that happening, but that's just a question that I would like to, you know, present for my own opinion. But <laughs> I'm going to take the Packers here just because, again, I don't think the Eli Magic is there this time. 
He's, you know, this giant team has been very fortunate to have the defense they've had. And just watching Eli Manning, I just, you know, there has to be that moment where, like, that, that postseason rabbit's foot or the postseason cloverleaf that's in his, <laughs> you know, football pocket or in his glove has to, you know, dry up. Because he can't, you know, start playing well again and start going through possibly Rodgers and the Cowboys, you know. Just like 07 where he beat the Cowboys and the... And the uh, and the Packers, and then he beat, I forget the other team he beat in 07. And in 2011, he beat Atlanta. Oh, yeah, he beat Atlanta. Yeah, see, just like 2011, he could beat Atlanta, the Packers, you know. Just kind of like his runs in 07-11, he could beat the teams that he beat to get there. Atlanta, Green Bay, uh, the Cowboys, um, and, okay, maybe maybe Seattle. But, but I don't think he played Seattle in those two other years, but, but I agree, so... So I'm going to trust that, you know, at home with how Aaron Rodgers has been playing, Eli Manning can put up his best postseason impression. But I think Aaron Rodgers, knowing what's at stake here, knowing that, you know, <laughs> you know, the Giants have that little, you know, confidence builder in them, I would try to use that as motivation and say, you are not going to let that happen. <laughs> we are going to shut down the uh, Giants to get you to four uh, one and dones for Manning compared to two Super Bowls instead of possibly Giant fans feeling three one and dones and three Super Bowls in his postseason tenure. So that's why I like Green Bay minus four and Green Bay straight up. Even though, again, the Giants can pull off giant, you know, magic, I wouldn't be surprised if the Giants win this game. But this is the game of the week I'm looking forward to the most. So those are my thoughts and, and picks this week. So like, comment, rate, subscribe. Happy New Year to everybody. Enjoy the new year. 2017 will be great for everybody. I hope. And I hope everybody that watched the video or everybody out there We'll have uh, positive experiences and uh, positive and uplifting success in uh, in their lives. So, happy New Year uh, for everybody out there. And until next week for the divisional round, this is Matt the Animal Fanatics signing off. Till then, so long.